2420 chefs, thank you for joining us today from across the country. Welcome to ACF's Exploring Culinary Cannabis webinar. You spoke and we listened. ACF chefs were polled about trends and you may be surprised to hear that cannabis edibles and beverages were listed as the top two trends of the year according to the 2019 What's Hot survey by the National Restaurant Association. Cannabis has moved onto the dinner table and the opportunity for chefs to enter this industry is growing. It's been a challenging year. So today let's focus on the future and look at new opportunities. For some of you, maybe your new career will be in cannabis cuisine or infused events. As a legal disclaimer, we are not doctors, we are not lawyers, we are food service professionals. And so we will not be inferring any legal or medical advice during this webinar. Just simply sharing the opinions of those chefs and beverage experts who are currently working in the industry in the United States, as well as in Canada, where cannabis is federally legal. Before we begin, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. And we have several polls. So let's start off with our first question of the day. Um, if you can answer this poll, that'd be great. So we can kind of see where you are when it comes to cannabis and edibles. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose <laughs> questions to the guest speaker. So let's get the discussion going in the chat by telling us where you're tuning in from today. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I am honored to introduce our guest presenters today. Please join me in welcoming Jamie Evans, the founder of The Herb Song, a culinary meets cannabis blog and lifestyle brand that's focused on the gourmet side of the cannabis industry. She's an entrepreneur, author, writer, and specializes in cannabis, CBD, food, recipes, wine, and the canna culinary world. Alongside her work in the cannabis space, Jamie is a certified specialist of wine and French wine scholar with over a decade of wine industry experience. As an industry thought leader, she was named one of Wine Enthusiast Magazine's top 40 under 40 tastemakers in 2018. So welcome. And just, we will um, start off with this first poll here. It looks like we have a lot of people here are learning or willing to learn a little bit more about cooking with cannabis. So it looks like about 30% of you are currently cooking with cannabis and 30% of you are um, not quite yet. So our next guest presenter is Andrew Friedman. He is known internationally as the Cannabis Sommelier. Andrew hosts and produces a YouTube channel titled The Cannabis Sommelier, where he teaches cannabis and wine pairings, cannabis cocktails, and cannabis cooking. Andrew is the author of Terpenes for Wellbeing, a book about cannabis, food, beverage, and wellness. And Andrew works with acclaimed chefs from across North America, organizing and presenting cannabis <coughs> wine dining events. So since I mentioned uh, the word terpenes, when it comes to Andrew's new book, we will, um, let me see, we will get to a, another quick poll. I'll just share the results really quick from our first one. And so you can see here, and then we will get into our second poll in just a moment. All right, so I will get back to that poll um, and launch that in just a moment. The next presenter is Chef Brandon Allen. He is the first High Times top cannabis chef and a partner of Tricome Institute, a cannabis education company. Brandon is currently writing uh, and a Cooking with Cannabis online course in partnership with the American Culinary Federation. So we are excited for that to launch in fall of 2021. So you can see we have quite a great uh, representation of the culinary and cannabis industry for today's webinar. We're certainly excited to get started. Get started. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the presentation over to Chef Brandon. Awesome, thanks so much, Jackie, and to the ACF for having the second 420 webinar. Um, excited to be a part of this again. So um, we are all going to briefly describe our menus for you. And um, we're gonna be ping-ponging back and forth here. Um, and, you know, we, we, we said, or Jackie said this earlier on, and I'll say it again, you know, we, we are chefs here today. We are not doctors, we're not medical experts. Uh, we are not prescribing, we're not recommending anything. We are here to talk to you about cannabis 
in food. Uh, and with that being said, what's what's really interesting is you're you're going to get some savory recipes here. Uh, you're going to get some cocktails, uh, but ultimately the kind of the focus here isn't so much about the recipes or the techniques in 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 our style of food. Uh, the the conversation is more focused on cooking with cannabis. So it's understanding these terpenes and cannabinoids and these different ingredients that we work with. So you can understand how they work and then apply them to your style of food. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a diehard carnivore. I eat meat on meat on meat. Um, you know, that is not going to be the same for all of y'all, but the way I teach you or the way we teach you about cannabis, a vegan could also apply those same techniques to their food. So that's the primary focus. So uh, just a, a, an overview of my, my menu, I'm going to be doing an air fried ribeye breakfast taco. And since it's 420 and you know my first time cooking in front of the ACF, I figured I would use one of the most modern uh, cooking techniques that there are, which is the microwave to make some scrambled eggs. Um, so you're gonna have uh, the air fried ribeye, a microwave scramble, which just, just give it a chance, don't judge me yet. Uh, and then I'm going to make an apple pepper slaw and a chimichurri sauce that'll go on the top there. And then I've got some different types of cannabis infusions today. I'm coming from Austin, Texas. So everything I'm working with is hemp based CBD. Okay, I promise. Um, so I'm gonna actually kind of get some of your feedback of uh, how you think I might should, or should infuse different things. I'll ask some questions. Also what terpenes use in some of these and kind of keep this interactive. So there you have it, uh, Andrew. Why don't you describe what you're going to be doing today? I'd love to, Brandon. Happy 420. <laughs> great seeing Happy everybody. It's great being here. My name is Andrew Friedman. I'm known as the Cannabis Sommelier. I'm coming to you from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, home of the Calgary Flames. I'm a WSET level three and a Canadian wine scholar. Very proud to represent the Canadian wine industry as it's very underrepresented in America, uh, even though you drink a lot of our great wine. So today, what am I going to be doing for you? Um, I just released a book, Terpenes for Wellbeing, and one of the recipes in it that's highlighted is infused mayonnaise. Um, I feel like a lot of people <laughs> enjoy store-bought mayonnaise way too much when it's such a simple ingredient to make. And, you know, if we're culinarians, we should be diving into that realm. So I'm going to be starting with an infused olive oil. We're going to skip over that because it's quite an easy uh, infusion, and we'll discuss it, uh, the process of decarboxylation and infusing a simple oil uh, as we cook. I'll be making a mayo and then I'm going to be making a beet pickled deviled egg. Uh, but I didn't go with beets. My wife actually made this awesome uh, pickled red cabbage, ginger and jalapeno. So I use this as my pickling liquid for the beet pickled deviled eggs. We'll be whipping that up and the filling is where we'll be putting our infusion. And then we're going to be pairing that with a Canadian wine and a little bit of homegrown Canadian cannabis. I'm looking forward to what Jamie's making. What are you making, Jamie? Well, hello, everyone. Happy 420. My name is Jamie Evans. I'm the founder of The Herb Psalm, as Jackie was mentioning earlier. I'm also the author of Cannabis Drinks, Secrets to Crafting CBD and THC Beverages at Home, which released last week. So I'm very excited to be here today to mix up a few different cannabis cocktails. I am mixing cannabis and alcohol today, um, but you can certainly make these mocktails if you want to. And I think the trick to mixing cannabis and alcohol is really keeping things low. As we say in the cannabis space, there's, called, there's, there's this golden rule, start low, go slow. So I'll be following that technique today. Uh, but my menu, we're gonna start out by making a cannabis infused citrus spice bitters. So I'm just going to walk you through the first couple steps on how to make this. It's actually a long process. It takes about 15 days. Uh, so I'll just show you how to um, set this up before we go into the drink. Um, after I demo the cannabis bitters, I'm then going to make a grapefruit Aperol spritz. Um, in my book, it actually calls for blood orange, but since it's almost summertime and spring, um, I'm going to sub the blood orange for some grapefruit to do that recipe. Um, I will then go into my Blue Dream Berry Mojito, which is another fun recipe from the book. And then to close things out, I'll be making my citrus spice and everything nice Negroni, which will be infused um, with the citrus spice bitters once again. So I, I'm excited to share a cannabis toast with you and let's get started. Excellent. Very good. Okay. So 
I have a little bit of TV magic that's going to be happening here. I'm going to switch over my camera here and show y'all. Um, so, by the way, you may have noticed um, I live in a van down by the river. Uh, my wife and I live full time in a 37 foot motorhome. And um, because of our little get up here, this is my kitchen, folks. Like you're looking at it. Um, two steps later and I'm in the foyer or in the living room. Um, but uh, because we have this little stove here, um, we got this air fryer. And as a diehard carnivore, I've been experimenting with all these different types of, um, of meats and, and things like that. So in here, I've got a giant ribeye that I have uh, two pieces of twine on there. And you can already tell this is at 200 degrees. You can already tell by the fat, how soft it's getting. So this is at 200 degrees. Uh, and I'm going to do that for about sure comes to 110. And then depending on where we're at with, um, with the setup here and everyone's recipes, I may just, uh, uh, increase the heat right away to about 375, give it that nice sear. Um, if we have time left over, which we're gonna go about 90 minutes uh, for, for the webinar here, uh, I may just pull that out and let it rest and then sear it so I can actually cut it while it's hot. So um, the reason I do this in the air fryer is again, the fat just totally melts. And I actually have some uh, CBD and CBG infused tallow or beef fat. So if I have enough pan dripping here, then what I'm going to do is combine the pan drippings with some of this, and that'll act as like one of our bases for an infusion just to kind of finish the, uh, the steak with once we slice it up. So from there, um, I'm going to do an apple pepper slaw with a Granny Smith. And I usually do Granny Smith and a Gala apple, but there's no Gala at Whole Foods down in here in Austin. So I have a honey crisp. The whole point here is to have one that's more tart and then one that has a little bit of sweetness. So you have that contrast and with some mini bell peppers, just really, really crisp and clean to bounce out that heavy profile of the ribeye, as well as the super stinky and delicious blue cheese that I've got here. And then for the, um, <clears throat> the slaw, I've got a couple different terpenes here that I want to get your feedback on and what you think that I should infuse this with as I'm cutting things up. Um, you know, terpenes in food are no different than like all these other spices and herbs that I've got up here. Okay. It's think of it as these terpenes or, or hydrocarbons. They're, they're the ingredients that make up an essential oil. Okay. So, uh, right here, like bergamot, for example, this is the essential oil of bergamot. Well, interestingly enough, the, one of the most dominant terpenes in bergamot is linalool. Linalool is also really high in cilantro. Uh, it is the most abundant that's found in all types of lavender and it's super floral. Linalool is also associated with cannabis strains that through inhalation have a more sedative and calming effect. Now, from a digestive standpoint, terpenes act very differently. They can have a, pharmacolog a pharmacological effect and physiological effect, but there's a major difference in the effects that you experience from inhalation to digestion. So we're going to play with some terpenes here. And then um, we're also going to infuse the uh, scrambled microwaved eggs uh, with some, I call it retail ready, which is a pre-infused fat base or some type of tincture. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, infusing cannabis into your food is actually really, really easy. Um, we, we, we all say this, that in order to be a cannabis chef, you have to be a chef first because there's a more of a responsibility to the food before you start adding psychotropic compounds into there. Uh, but once you do, learning how to add them in is actually very, very simple. But then the responsibility to understanding how these different compounds are going to affect people um, and how they work together uh, in good and or bad ways, uh, depending on how they're consumed. Um, and, and understanding just like the, the pharmacology side, not so much from a medicinal standpoint, but just understanding the you know, psychotropic or to intoxicating or psychoactive to intoxicating spectrum and how you can work with these different things and dosing accordingly and things like that. So um, now that we've done a little bit of TV magic because this is already going, um, 
I'm just going to let that cook and I'm going to pass it off to Jamie so she can get started with our first cocktail um, and Great. we'll go from there. Perfect. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is prepare the citrus spice bitters. And when you're making bitters, um, we're actually using a high proof alcohol, which really does the job of extracting the cannabinoids to make your, or to make your infusion um, as potent as possible. So today I'm actually using um, some bullet rye for this citrus spice bitters. And of course, like the name says, we're going to be putting a lot of citrus um, different spices to really play up those flavors. And so the first thing you want to do is have your 32 ounce mason jar on hand. And we're doing the combined method to make this bitter. So basically you're combining everything into this jar. And essentially you'd be uh, storing this in a dark closet for 15 days. But of course we're doing the quick version today. Um, so what you want to do before you actually start mixing up this bitters is decarboxylate 10 grams of cannabis. So I decarboxylated this cannabis last night and I actually use this really cool device. I don't know if you guys have heard of this device, but it's called the Ardent, which is basically um, an all-in-one cooking device, which makes decarbing super easy. So I put all of the flour in here, basically hit go and it decarbs the flour perfectly for me. Um, so the flour that I'm using today to really play up those citrus notes, um, I wanted something that's very rich and limonene. So I actually chose a strain called Forbidden Fruit, uh, which is a blend of cherry pie and tangy. Uh, if you've had Forbidden Fruit before, it also has these beautiful red fruit characteristics, which, which is really going to play well with the drinks that we're making today. Uh, so after you have decarboxylated your cannabis flour, you're just going to pour it right in to your cannabis jar. And I'm gonna pour it in right up here. And so there we go. And you guys can see there's all the 10 grams that are in there. Um, the next ingredient is adding a fourth of a cup of dried lemon peel and a fourth of a cup of dried orange peel. And so these are freshly peeled and then I heated these up in the oven to make them nice and crispy. Uh, so there, when I was heating this up yesterday too, the whole house just smelled like terpenes and citrus and it just uh, was very nice. I'm excited to add these into the jar. So you're gonna add a fourth of a cup of the lemon and this is gonna add all those really nice citrus notes. Um, that's gonna play well with the forbidden fruit flower. Um, the next is just adding those orange peels I'm gonna add them right into the jar. And so next we're gonna add um, all of the spices to make this nice and spicy. So uh, what I wanna do is just add five cardamom pods and then I cracked these already. So they're partially cracked to help uh, just get all of those um, flavors out of the cardamom. I'm also gonna add a stick of cinnamon. You can just throw it right in. And then I chopped up about an inch of a piece of ginger and so um, you can pretty much add as much ginger as you'd like into this, depending on how much you like ginger. But I'm just gonna add uh, about one inch of a piece and then I cut it up into little pieces. Um, because we're making a bitters, we're going to add our bittering agent. So today I'm going to use a Sincona bark cut. And if you guys have seen this before, um, I don't know if you guys, I'm gonna come closer to the camera, but you can see that the bark, this is our bittering agent that we're gonna add in. To the jar. You can just throw it right in. And so this is about um, a half of a teaspoon. And so once you have all of your ingredients in your 32 ounce mason jar, it's pretty easy. You're just going to add the alcohol on top. <laughs> I'm spilling everywhere. So you can just add it right on top. And you just want to make sure that all of the um, ingredients that you've put into the mason jar are completely covered because this is going to sit for 15 days. Uh, and once everything is in here, you can just put a top on the mason jar and you're gonna shake it up. And so basically what you wanna do is let this sit for 15 days and every day you wanna go and check on it and then shake it up to really mix those ingredients. And remember the alcohol is really acting as your solvent to pull out the cannabinoids. And so this becomes a very potent, uh, bitters that we're going to add into the cocktail. And so I'm going to do a little bit of mixology magic. And at the end of the process, 
um, you're basically going to have a nice bitter just like this. And so um, what I like to do is store it in a swing top bottle. So it's nice and easy to applicate in your drink. I usually have just like a dropper cap that I use as well. So we're going to use this to infuse two cocktails today. Uh, the first one I'm going to make is very easy. I'm going to do it right now. So I have something to sip on. <laughs> and I think that you guys are going to enjoy this. So this is, um, well, in the book, I, uh, it's a blood orange Aperol spritz, but today it's not very uh, blood orange season. So I'm substituting for some ruby red grapefruit. And so um, what I did is I just juiced um, the grapefruit and then I removed all of the pulp because you want to have a very smooth drinking experience when you're having a spritz. Um, so I used a fine mesh strainer to basically separate um, the pulp from the juice. And so you're just gonna add um, a half ounce into your glass. My ice is a little melted, um, but that's okay. We're gonna work with it. Uh, so you're just gonna pour the grapefruit juice into the bottom of your glass. The next thing we're gonna do is add the Aperol. And so today, like I said at the beginning, we're doing Aperol spritz and Negroni. So I'm using Aperol with this and then Campari with the Negroni and both of these um, liqueurs just really work well with cannabis flavors because there's a lot of citrus, there's a lot of spice notes. Uh, and I just really love how it mixes with the cannabis flavor. So we're gonna add two ounces of the Aperol. Of course, Aperol, the colors is so beautiful as well. So this is a really nice spring cocktail that you can make. Um, there you go. And so the next step is just adding your Prosecco. And so I'm just gonna add three ounces and I'm gonna pour it right in. And of course, this is like one of the easiest drinks that you can make. So um, it's just fun when you're in something, when you want something fast, uh, but also very delicious and potent. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is add our citrus spice infused bitters. And so I just like to use this little dropper cap and you can basically add as much as you want, depending on um, your preferred dose, which is really great about these cocktails and cannabis drinks, is it's very customizable. Um, so we're going to go ahead, I'm going to add in a few dashes and just stir it up. And of course, um, I really think bitters has this capability of bringing flavors together. And so I love adding bitters in most of my drinks. So um, there's actually bitters in all three, three of these drinks today. Uh, and then of course, we're just gonna garnish. Um, I'm gonna put a cannabis leaf on top and then just a slice of the grapefruit. And there you go. We have our first cannabis cocktail of the day. Um, I'm gonna just prop that up a little bit and cheers everybody. Cheers, very good. Cheers, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. I'd like to take 30 seconds and geek out on something real quick because you mentioned the word decarb or decarboxylation, uh, just yes. so everyone is familiar with what that means. So uh, raw cannabis flower, okay? So whether it's hemp or it's marijuana, so high CBD or high THC, by itself cannot make you feel high, okay? Because the form of THC, let's use marijuana in this instance, the form of THC is called THCA, it's in its acid or in its raw form, okay? So even after the flower is dried and cured, it has to be heated in order to remove that carboxyl group. So the heat basically evaporates a structure of the THC molecule. And when that evaporates off, now that molecule has the shape that's required to basically uh, bind with your CB1 or cannabinoid one receptor. And that is what allows you to feel the high or the intoxicating effects of marijuana. So if you were to just eat some raw flour, you're not gonna feel high. And that's why in order for any of these infusions as from an edible standpoint to work, they have to be heated first. Uh, decarbing happens immediately when you are smoking, okay? Uh, but from an edible perspective, this is one of the most crucial steps in making sure that people will think that your food will taste a lot better because they're high. That's all. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, thank you for and, explaining that. <laughs> and if you need any clarification, there is uh, detailed descriptions of both me and Jamie's books. And uh, I have videos on YouTube and I think uh, some of us also have videos on YouTube. So that's great. 
Um, yeah, there, well, I guess there's a, there's a lot of variance with decarboxylation. You will see different temperatures and times. Um, you can go lower and slow at 200 degrees for a longer period of time, or you, know, you can do 266 degrees Fahrenheit within 30 minutes and every cannabinoid is going to be decarbed. Um, so, so, you know, there, there's a lot of lab tests and things that go along with working with these e extracts, which is what we're all doing. Um, so understanding your dose is going to be dependent on understanding the efficiency of your decarboxylation. Uh, and we can dive more into that later, but th there, there's a huge science behind it, which is crucial for anyone who's looking to cope with cannabis and be able to accurately dose their customers. No, totally, Brandon. And I love uh, personally the sous vide method when I'm decarbing. So don't count mm -hmm. out uh, different ways to heat things yeah. up. Sous vide really seems to keep a lot of those terpenes, a lot of the beautiful resonance that the plant gives and that complexity of aroma. Um, cool. Well, what am I doing today? We're going to make beet pickled deviled eggs, as I said, with a little bit of wine pairing. I saw that 420 passed on the East Coast. I hope everybody had rolled one up, smoked one, <laughs> enjoyed one, had a puff, had an infused drink. Jamie's drink looks delicious. I think it's really cool to see how simple it is to cocktail with cannabis, to cook with cannabis. We often really overlook the simplicity of a lot of ingredients. And one big thing about me is I'm a song, right? I'm a talker. I'm a smoker. I'm a drinker. In my house, my, my wife is the chef. Uh, when I first started doing dining events, she was the chef cooking for 12, 18 people doing these amazing fine dining dishes. So she's the one that taught me this and I loved it so much. Uh, I thought I had to share it with everybody else because again, mayo, what a simple thing, but what a versatile ingredient when we really look at the kitchen. It's egg and olive oil, a little bit of Dijon, salt and pepper. Where can't we use that to moisten things up? Uh, you know, even as far as cake, you may be disgusted by that, but that's okay. Um, so mayo is so easy. Like it's a single egg. The egg is really the star of the show. You have some olive oil. This is my infused olive oil. I also have a, another bigger one over here because I'm going to make a pretty good dose of mayo because we need to share it with the friends and family. Um, and it's just a little bit of Dijon, a little bit of salt, a little bit of olive oil, and then we'll whip it in the food processor. But if you've never made mayo before, the hardest part is, is adding the oil super slow, make sure it doesn't break. How did I infuse my olive oil? Uh, this was done with THC distillate in a crock pot. I do have the Ardent, but I'm, I'm such a traditionalist. I love my, my little, uh, crock pot fill it with olive oil, take THC distillate. Distillate's already gone through uh, the decarboxylation process because it is steam distilled. So it's already activated. So you're able to just pop it in there. Uh, for me, it's a shorter emulsification time so that I get to retain a lot of those flavors in the olive oil. Sometimes when you overheat olive oil, you know, you tend to get a lot more of those grassy flavors, those undesirables that scare people away from it sometimes. Um, yeah, and then the beet pickled deviled eggs. So I'm gonna do some movie magic too. I got one hard boiled egg, but that is, is white still. Uh, it's not ice cold and I don't wanna be a disaster peeling this on camera for you. So we'll see what happens with that. But I do have my halved and pickled uh, eggs here, which are just a beautiful color now. And that is from this pickled cabbage with ginger and jalapeno. And one of the cool things about the purple color uh, from beets, from cabbage, it's the same purple coloring that happens in cannabis. Those anthocyanins are that coloring agent and, and it's what makes purple plants purple. Uh, so a little bit diffuse in there. And this, this is just so rich and fragrant when you get things uh, you know, pickled and a little bit fermenting and a little bit weird, they often uh, bring out the best of things. And we as culinarians and chefs know we like to explore that spiciness. This is such a great spicy crunch. Uh, anyways, so we have our pickled eggs in the brining solution. Uh, that, that again, just a little salt, little sugar, vinegar, uh, ginger, jalapeno, cabbage, super easy. Uh, and then in the rest of the deviled egg, it's just gonna be a little bit of mayo, a little bit of vinegar, uh, a little bit of Dijon, a little bit of curry powder. We will end up piping it out, make it look nice and pretty. And then obviously pair it with some great Canadian wine because I know uh, a lot of you don't know enough about Canadian wine, but it's so close to New York, it might as well be Finger Lakes uh, Riesling, which is awesome. But let's crack into it, pun totally intended, and start making the mayo. So the first thing you have to do is crack your egg. I'll pop it into my food processor. Hopefully this is the right one. There we go. Oh, 
I'll move this a little bit closer for you. Sorry, guys. Hey, what kind of leaves are they? They look weird. Uh, those are from strawberry guavas <laughs> that were uh, hanging out. You know, here in Canada, we're all allowed to grow four plants, every single person. So you can uh, grow a lot of cannabis with four plants. I was, I was I making my... like a normal, a normal like basil joke, you know, like or some oregano. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Oh, it's weird. Sorry. Sorry. It, it, the basil's <laughs> in the back. I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm just, uh, my mission's to normalize cannabis. I'm just too into it as a normal ingredient. Uh, when I do my mayos, I do yolk and all because I like the color of the darker mayo. If you don't like a darker mayo, you can just rock um, egg whites only. And I'm just going to put this on the food processor for 20 seconds if somebody else has an anecdote. So you're using distillate in, in this. And um, just so you all know, distillate, as he said, is already decarboxylated. Um, it is activated. So that THCA, that acid compound is gone. It is an intoxicating compound. Um, when we're dealing with distillate, there's a bunch of different ways to get there. Uh, there are various extraction processes, uh, regardless of what it starts with, whether it's ethanol, hydrocarbon, rosin, it can be hash or anything. Uh, to get to the distillate process, you, there's a lot of refinement. And what happens is, you know, your, your normal flour that's 15 to 20, maybe 30% THC, uh, what happens with distillate is you're up there in the 80 to even 90% of concentration for uh, THC. It really depends on the processor. So uh, from a cannabis chef's perspective, distillate is fantastic to use when you don't want to impart any flavor of cannabis into your dish. Um, and you wanna make sure that you have a very accurate dose because it's already decarbed and you don't have to worry about extracting anything. If you put a thousand milligrams into a, a, a huge dish that is properly homogenized, you will be able to dose it out accordingly with incredible accuracy. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Perfect explanation. I really like cooking with distillate um, just because sometimes I'm not a huge fan of cannabis flavors. I know our role as culinarians is to expand people's observation of what cannabis can be as an ingredient. Um, but for the purpose of this dish, it's much easier for me to pair it with cannabis that I would vaporize after than to highlight it in the actual egg. Um, so if we'll go to my second camera, I've got my egg nice and emulsified. Uh, just get it nice and frothy so that everything falls together. We'll then just go ahead and we add our other emulsifiers, the things that really make it stick together. Dijon is like, the master key to all of this. Um, it's so interesting because like these are all the ingredients kids hate and I get why I hated mayo as a kid. I'm gonna put a little extra Dijon because I like it spicy and it's 420. Yeah, it smells great. Throwing it everywhere. That's okay, as long as it doesn't get on my suit, I don't really care. Again, I'm a citizen scientist, not a chef, home cook. And that's why I love this because uh, anybody can cook with cannabis and making a mess is one of the most fun parts of cooking, right? And mixology. Well, and I always mixology. make a big mess in the kitchen with my drinks. Love it. That down. Uh, I got a half tablespoon of lemon juice. Boom, boom. And we're going to do a quarter teaspoon of salt, which is really just a pinch. There we go. And now I need to throw that back on the processor again. If somebody wants to chat about something for two seconds, will I do a, the mixing dance? The mixing dance. I like that. Yes, but back on the processor, 20 seconds. Does, uh, hey, Jackie, are there any questions that we could answer quickly? Something that you've seen a couple of people ask that are, there's a yeah. crowd of curiosity. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the questions um, was, what it, or if, if there's a formula to determine the amount of dosage um, that you should be putting in edibles? That's a great question. And the answer is very confusing in a way because um, there is no direct answer. So um, when, it, when it comes to infusing, and what I'm talking about here specifically, not CBD, 
not non-intoxicating cannabinoids. I'm talking about intoxicating cannabinoids like THC. When you are infusing them into food, you need as a cannabis chef to be able to identify the individual consumer tolerance or the individual diner's tolerance, okay? Uh, if you're doing a massive catering uh, event, we generally as a whole recommend two and a half to five milligrams max of THC. Depending on the event, you could go upwards of 10 if it's spaced out. Um, and people have the option to say, skip a course that's infused. But for a lot of smaller dining experiences where I've done up to 20 to 50 people by myself, uh, I still was able to, um, you know, identify individual tolerance and dose accordingly because how we're making these infusions, we, we generally always have some element of the dish that is not infused, um, or we're able to basically uh, just completely bypass the infusion because honestly, there's times where you can take some infused extra virgin olive oil and literally just drizzle it on top of a dish and it's infused. So there's really nothing that's missing for a lot of things if I don't add it in there. But on average, two and a half to five milligrams for a new person. We generally have a cap at most cannabis dining experience of 10 milligrams. Um, and even though people may have higher tolerances than that, you can dose a little extra here and there if you want. You would be shocked to find out how many people say they can handle 10, 20, 30, 50 milligrams. And then you give them five and they're floored. So that's what we try and prevent. Love it. I think Thanks, also, uh, oh, just one, one thing to add yeah, to yeah, that too. So if you are talking about like a formula that you can calculate at home to really determine the potency, there are different um, mathematical equations that you can use. Um, in my book, I have one. I know Chef Brandon Allen works with one as well. Um, and so does Andrew. And so what's actually helped me is I have a spreadsheet that I work with and I put in all the calculations. And based on the flour that I use, I just go ahead and pop in um, the amount of THC, the amount of CBD, and then calculate it out per serving. Uh, and so, you know, it'll never be perfect. Our kitchens are not labs, but we can do our best to make estimates. And so, yeah, anytime I make a, an infusion at home, I always do my calculations to estimate the dose. Love it. And that goes back to my infusion today that I'm just about to pour in. Uh, because I use distillate, this is fully activated. When you're decarboxylating flour, you have a slight loss in your cannabinoids, but with distillate, it retains all of those cannabinoids. So I know in the mayonnaise that I'm making today, I have exactly 500 milligrams because I used a half gram of distillate in my cup of olive oil today. So it's just all about thinking about it simply. We've all done the dosing in kitchens. Um, you know, we don't taste salt in a cake. We all know how to spread cannabis out through it. Okay, so uh, the mayo is emulsified. You can see that the egg's nice and whipped. The Dijon is whipped in there. The Dijon's the nice emulsifier. Uh, the next step is the infused olive oil. Like I mentioned, I have a half gram in my 250 mils here. So it's a very easy calculation once I put it on a sandwich or I put it into my next ingredient. Um, but let's just whip that up. And if you've never made mayonnaise before, it's all about slow and steady because there's nothing worse than breaking your mayo after putting a half gram of THC distillate into a cup of olive oil. So I'm gonna rip that up to finish my mayo. And in a couple minutes, I will uh, dive back and it'll be nice and fluffy and I'll show you guys that. All right, so up next here, I'm going to be getting started with the limonene as well as CBD infused chimichurri sauce that we're gonna have for this breakfast taco. Um, so I have a little uh, ninja blender here that I'm gonna do this in. Honestly, if you wanna mince all these fresh herbs by hand and the garlic, you can easily do this and toss it together. It's totally fine that way, but even an immersion blender, this will work in a food processor, whatever you'd like. So um, since this is kind of like one of those upside down situations where um, I'm gonna end up flipping this, uh, what I would recommend doing is if your blender is set up like a Vitamix uh, with your blade at the bottom, put all of your fresh herbs in first. In this case, I'm gonna put them in last because as I flip this, I want all the liquids kind of weigh down those herbs and make sure that they are, are mixing around in the blender there. 
Um, and by the way, we're going to be emailing everyone a little PDF of all of these recipes with all of our contact information. Uh, all three of us are, are more than willing and open to, uh, to communicating with y'all. We were, we're really excited about, you know, seeing a professional entity like the ACF embracing cannabis. So we will make ourselves available um, and also the, the online cannabis uh, cooking with cannabis course that Tricom Institute is uh, developing in partnership with the American Culinary Federation will uh, feature some additional recipe submissions by Jamie and Andrew as well. But just to keep the, the focus again, which is, hold on, my, my, uh, my ribeye is uh, barking at me here. Okay, the fat is just melting already. That looks amazing. <laughs> I'm at 100 degrees. We need to get this to 110, and then I'm going to let that rest. Um, anyway, so the whole focus of this course uh, is to teach you how to cook with cannabis, not teach you how to cook, okay? So the recipes are just going to be like there, so you can get ideas of how we're infusing these into food, but the whole goal of the course is for you to take the information and apply it to the style of food that you're super excited about. So, all right, with this chimichurri, we've got, this is a half cup. So we're gonna do a cup and a half of, this is a hemp-based CBD extra virgin olive oil that I did a flour-based extraction with. And then I further supplemented it with some um, CBD isolate, which I've got some CBG isolate here. Y'all can see it kind of just looks like, um, like a powder. Okay, a little dark on that angle, but uh, this is CBG, CBD cannabidiol, and then this again is CBG cannabigerol, um, are two different uh, non-intoxicating cannabinoids that are found in hemp and marijuana, okay? And then we're going to do uh, three quarters of a cup here of some red wine vinegar. So the reason that I essentially, you could say fortified or supplemented my my infusion there with more CBD. It's just based off of a lot of the research on CBD. Uh, you need a lot more of it than, you know, 10 or 20 milligrams per serving for it to be effective, unless it's in combination with THC. And since this is hemp derived, even though there's, you know, small 0.3% THC, which is legal here in the United States, uh, that is a, not a significant amount. So based on the data, I like to make sure that I'm getting a couple hundred milligrams of CBD, whether it is an isolate or a full spectrum type of base. Um, so the way I calculated this recipe ends up being uh, roughly, um, I think it's about 18 ounces. I will double check that once I measure this out. But the way the olive oil is set up there, uh, I have a cup and a half and per tablespoon, um, there would be about 50 milligrams total of CBD. And in this instance, you're thinking the amount of chimichurri, you're probably putting two or three tablespoons, uh, depending on how many you like to get in there um, and how much extra you like to have. Uh, so you're going to get a good dose of CBD here. Now, this calls for about a tablespoon of honey. When I was in uh, Pittsburgh, I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for culinary school. I had uh, an opportunity to create my own apprenticeship with a chef on the Olympic culinary team. Um, and so a lot of my focus in school was doing competitions. I did some with the ACF um, and with Sam Pellegrino, as well as uh, what actually opened up the door for me in the cannabis industry was by competing in the first High Times Top Cannabis Chef Cooking Competition, which I was fortunate to, to win. But my culinary school background uh, and the competitive things that I worked with, with uh, Chef Sean Culp, never, if I hadn't had that foundation, I never really would have had this like, just opportunity to get into the industry the way that I did. Um, and while I was in culinary school, I was working at a restaurant called Gaucho, which is an Argentinian Perea. Um, and it was just meat on meat on meat. So it was like my favorite place in the world. And um, they had this chimichurri sauce that was just absolutely to die for. And I made my own variation of that to be able to feature uh, a terpene. Well, the thing is, is there's already terpenes in here. All of the, the parsley and the oregano that I'm going to be adding in here are filled with terpenes. It's one of the dominant uh, aroma compounds that when you're smelling them, even tasting, uh, that, that you are you're presented with. So as a chef or a cannabis chef, you've been cooking with terpenes for, well, since you've been cooking, since you've been working with plants. Um, but cool 
is since cannabis has basically put terpenes like on the map, thousand in the plant kingdom alone, uh, in cannabis, there's several hundred that have been identified, uh, about a half dozen you're going to see on most cannabis lab tests. But these things are just really awesome ingredients to cook with and to really either change sometimes not just the aroma, but the flavor, which can go south quickly if you put too much, but also the mouthfeel of ingredients uh, you can totally alter um, with these terpenes. So this limonene, three, four. I got four drops in there. This is this is in the world of pungency of terpenes. This is one of the more mild terpenes. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's ten drops in all of that. I'm putting ten drops of this. Ten drops. Uh, wow. In here. Okay. You went in, you went in yep. on it. I wouldn't have used that much if uh, still terps. <laughs> so the thing is, is you have to know your terpenes because the brand that I'm using, my limonene, ten drops could be equivalent to another brand's five. OK, so um, it's like, you know, there's different salts depending on the, 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 the coarseness of the, the salt or how fine it is can actually taste saltier than others. Um, and there's different types of sugar or sweeteners out there. Um, you know, it's like something like that, the, the little tiny uh, fraction of a teaspoon of stevia can just be disgustingly sweet and versus like a tablespoon, a tablespoon or two of sugar. OK. Um, so you have to be very careful with your ingredients that you're experimenting with here. Um, citral, for example, uh, citral right here, one drop of citral is equivalent in my case with limonene or linalool or pinene or some of the others that I'm using on a regular basis. One drop of this will be two to three times more potent than even 20 drops of limonene. So you got to be really Good careful with these. Okay, yeah. so the rest of the ingredients here, I've got about three to four cloves of garlic I'm just going to throw in here. I have an ounce of fresh oregano, and then I've got two ounces. And the reason I do that by weight is because um, it's, it's your half cup of chopped herbs might be different than my half cup of chopped herbs. Um, hopefully I don't overflow here. I usually do this in a different blender. Now, for the most part, I have a lot of the stems removed out of here, um, except for the little bit finer one. Like that one's probably borderline to where I would say you don't want to go any thicker than that in here. There's plenty of flavor in parsley stems. This is flat leaf, flat Italian. You can easily use curly leaf in this as well. You know, one of the things is like when you say chimichurri, it's almost like saying salsa or hot sauce. Um, there's a lot of different variations out there. Some people think that you should never, ever put cilantro in a chimichurri. Some people think that it's not a chimichurri without it. So however you like your chimichurri, uh, again, you're welcome to use this recipe or use your own and then just replace your olive oil with some infused olive oil. Know what your dose is per serving. You know, that's one thing that whenever you're making a recipe as a cannabis chef, you need to, before you dose anything, you need to say, okay, well, what's my serving size? And then work backwards from there because you don't want to make cakes or cookies or, uh, you know, a big sauce like this and you ov overly dose it to the point where now the, the serving size is a quarter teaspoon. Otherwise you're going to get someone totally blasted to the moon and back, which we don't want. So, um, I'm just going to blend this. And, um, you know, one thing I want to say, uh, Jamie, uh, she just launched a, a book a couple of weeks ago and, um, from, did. on behalf, on behalf of Tricom Institute, we wanted to thank you. Uh, for featuring uh, Max Montrose, my, my partner and founder of Tri uh, and, and the interpreting book. So could you take a moment and, and share with everyone about your book um, and where they can absolutely. get it while I'm making some noise over here? Yeah, absolutely. So all throughout the book, you're going to find recipes for cannabis drinks, but also a lot of how-to techniques and expert spotlights. So as Brandon mentioned Max Montrose is in the book in chapter one and he explores interpining um, which is really a method that the Tricom Institute developed um, to interpret your cannabis um, specifically terpenes which really help us evaluate the aromas and flavors um, of the cannabis product that you're working with and so in chapter one um, it also goes into diff different sensory evaluation techniques that I learned in the wine world and I apply that to cannabis and also um, I talk about pairings and how you can pair uh, cannabis with your cuisine or with wine and cocktails. Uh, so there's a lot of great how-to information. Um, in chapter three, it's all about infusions, which I'll touch on um, when I make this mojito. 
uh, and a little bit later in the in the show, but uh, it's just a really great exploration of cannabis drinks, um, not only recipes, but just a lot of technique on how to craft cannabis drinks at home. So yeah, oh, awesome. and where to find it? <laughs> you can find it on Amazon, <laughs> Barnes and Noble, uh, just Google cannabis drinks by Jamie Evans and you should be able to find it. Excellent, well, I know Max got his copy and uh, I'm excited to, to order mine. So thank you. All right, folks. So I'm at 109 degrees. I'm going to pull this ribeye out and uh, let it rest. Um, and then once we get, you know, towards the, the uh, probably another 15 minutes or so, I'll put this back in. We'll crank the heat up. We'll get a nice sear. We'll get that Maillard reaction. All us uh, chef geeks out there. Some of you just got excited by that. Some of you were like, what the hell kind of duck is he talking about? Anyway, um, so the next important thing for this chimichurri is we're going to add some salt. It's pretty simple. Now you can see here, I'll pull it over to this camera. Uh, this is essentially kind of emulsified to a point because of the fact that it's oil and vinegar. Um, so for right now, the way this looks almost creamy, that works great for a chimichurri. Now, as you store this, uh, even in the refrigerator, you know, the olive oil will, will tighten up a bit. And then once that rests, this will break. And then all you really have to do is just give it a shake um, and, and you're, you're good to go. And then you'll see it won't look as creamy or cloudy, but this right here, what I love about this sauce for a, for a chimichurri is that it holds its body because it's got a more medium nappe. So it is going to just, you know, grasp onto every little element of this breakfast taco instead of kind of just draining out. So if you are, if you have like a blender set up like this where you, you can just put the lid on and store it for your chimichurri, when you want to use it, you have guests come over, it's great because you can just throw that blender lid on there whip it up a bit and it'll come like uh, it'll turn out like this and this also makes a great dip as well so it's not your typical in this instance by being blended uh chimichurri salsa like you would see at a lot of restaurants um so but if that's what you want then i would recommend using a food processor and just pulsing these things together or just do it all by hand and then add your liquid so i'm just going to add some salt here and then we're going to move on to the the next part here my computer just uh, went black so let's see here who's next i got you brother and you know what awesome. i didn't break my mayonnaise as you talk about the food processor I use my food processor. I love my Ninja. Slow pulse, add your olive oil slowly. And this is what I end up with, a beautiful, beautifully colored mayo. Let me show you the awesome. texture. And when I make this it mayo, great. It, thank you. It doesn't tend to break uh, for, you know, if you do it slow enough, it won't break for a month. Sometimes this stays good for two months. If you have a little bit of mold inhibitor, uh, I find that the mayo can even hang for three months because it's just shell stable olive oil and one egg and a little bit of salt. Um, so let's dive mm. into what I'm going to mm. do with the mayo. We're going to fill, make the filling for the deviled eggs. Um, so I slice and de-yolk my eggs before I put them in the brining solution because I don't like it if it gets too deep with the brining. Sometimes when you have a really dark color, it won't, uh, or it'll get right to the yolks and then you don't get that contrast of color. And one thing I love about a pickled, a beet pickled or a, a cabbage pickled deviled egg is just that shocking color. A lot of people are nervous around pickled eggs, especially different colors, but what a sensory stimulation. When we're talking about cooking with cannabis, we can really enlighten so many senses from our, our eyes using visual art to stimulate our nose, to experience more things on the palate, but then evoke emotion and bring us back to that moment in time. So that's really what cooking with cannabis is for me, is creating a moment that you'll remember forever. So let's make this egg filling. And it's pretty simple to be honest. I'll go down to my second camera. I got my yolks. One of my yolks was a little bit more omega 3E. And we're just gonna splash in our infused olive oil, which is easy out of my cool little skull jar. Make sure you always label your cannabis ingredients. You don't want to cook with cannabis ingredients by accident. That has happened many a times in my house and it's always funny when it does happen. So we've got two tablespoons of olive oil. We're gonna take a tablespoon of the mayo that I just made. We'll chuck that in there too. So that's a double infusion. One tablespoon of the mayo, some Dijon. We're gonna go with a teaspoon of Dijon. 
the, 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 again, Dijon is such a, such a great emulsifier, such a wonderful flavor, and such an awesome place in France that grows incredible, incredible Pinot Noir. But kind of a rough my, and tumble place. It's my favorite grape, man. Oh, really? Me the too. Pinot Noir? <laughs> me, me, yep, me too. It is. And Especially from anecdote. France. <laughs> when when I uh, when I made wine when I was a winemaker's apprentice uh, I worked with a wonderful winemaker Jack Kemp a wonderful uh, lady winemaker and she uh, studied in Burgundy in Grand Cru's and Premier Cru's and uh, Pinot Noir grows incredible in Canada because it's a cold weather hardy grape but very low output and our Pinot Noir actually won double gold medal at the Canadian Wine Awards our 2016 Pinot Noir so that was one that I actually nice. uh, you know did did so much work with and I'm I'm absolutely so proud of. Uh, incredible. So I love that we all love Pinot Noir because it has a special place in my heart forever. Absolutely. I also love how it just reflects terroir so well. And yeah, it's one of my favorite grapes. Oh yeah. If you haven't drank Canadian Pinot, it's killer. It's very similar to like, uh, you know, a colder climate, Oregon or Washington, like uh, yeah. the best, the best showings really have that awesome, like cherry popsicle but it's still a lot of the same clones, a 666, 667, 777 clone is widely growing here. So you do get a lot of those Burgundian flavors and funk. And especially because we have so many winemakers coming internationally, uh, you know, the right wood is coming, the right oaking is coming. And so you're getting a lot of those Burgundian styles in Canada as well, which is really, really, really cool to me. Love okay, it. Half, half teaspoon of curry powder because you need that kick. And that's that awesome color in your uh, deviled egg filling, a little bit of salt and pepper to taste. We all know we like a decent amount. We need, we need a good amount or else it doesn't actually taste like very much, right? Salt, I'm not as good with. I always do the hand pinch like they taught me in culinary class in high school. I was lucky to go to somewhere with such a great uh, culinary program. Ooh, I forgot my Vinegar. Hold on. I need to zip to the pantry. Somebody say something quick. <laughs> Here, I'll uh, show other... you something. Oh, yeah. Show us something. <laughs> I, I'm just like doing a little uh, side prep here. So um, for my apple pepper slaw, if you want to get a um, uh, this camera <laughs> view, um, quick little tip when you're julienning these little peppers, what's really helpful to do is just half them lengthwise. Take a spoon or a teaspoon, and then you can just scoop out your pith in the seeds in the stem in one shot and then press them down so they're not curved so you have more stability on your cutting board and then go ahead and slice up your julienne so i'll be doing this in the background beauty thank you and i got my vinegar so we're good on my second camera we got our whole uh slurry that we will mash up and we'll go with the old guacamole style with a fork and we'll just make this a nice even emulsified consistency uh, and I will come back to show you how we're going to pipe it in the egg and we'll pair it with some wine. Wonderful. Should I make my next drink, Chef Brandon? Hell yeah, I'm thirsty. <laughs> All right, perfect. So the next drink I'm going to move into is called the Blue Dream Berry Mojito. This is another recipe from my book, Cannabis Drinks. Um, you can find it right here. But I'm actually going to use blackberries today. Um, and the best thing about this recipe is you can really substitute for whatever berry you want. Um, so I'm going to demo it with blackberries today. Um, and what I'm going to infuse this cocktail with is a simple syrup. This is a rich, simple syrup that I infuse with Blue Dream flour to really keep the um, flavors consistent with each other. And so when you're doing a rich, simple syrup, the technique that I'll teach you in the book is how to use the stove top method for infusion. And so because this is a rich, simple syrup, um, we're gonna do a two to one ratio of sugar to water to really make this simple syrup rich. Um, and rich, simple syrup is sweeter than regular simple syrups. So you actually don't need to add as much to the drink, which really helps concentrate the flavors because um, you're not adding as much liquid in. So I really, really love using um, rich, simple syrup in the book. And so basically when you're infusing this, you're gonna use your decarboxylated flour, um, the sugar and water, and you're gonna heat um, this mixture over the stove top for 50 minutes. And then the secret ingredient that I like to add um, to really help extract those cannabinoids is food grade vegetable glycerin to really act as that solvent uh, that will help extract those cannabinoids. 
Um, so you just add that food grade glycerin right into your saucepan. You continue to heat in, uh, for 10 minutes. And so basically you have your infused rich simple syrup within an hour. It does take a little bit of time um, but in the book, I teach you how to make a larger batch because you're going to use this simple syrup to infuse many drinks um, throughout the book. And uh, it's just something that's really handy to have on hand when you're crafting cannabis drinks. Um, so uh, the first thing we're going to do, um, I already juiced this earlier, but you're going to juice uh, three fourths of an ounce of fresh lime juice. And so I'm just going to measure it out here. And again, um, I removed some of the uh, the pulp that's in here, but that's up to you depending on what uh, style of lime you like. So I'm just going to add into the, the base of the glass. I'm using a highball glass for this mojito today. Uh, the next thing I'm going to add is just six fresh mint leaves. And so before you add mint into your glass, I really like to slap it on my hand. So this wakes slap up it good. all of <laughs> this wakes up all the mint uh, flavors and aromas that are in there. Like I can, I can just smell all these uh, mint oils waking up. So you're gonna add six fresh mint leaves into the bottom of your glass. And then- You know, what, we're what a do... great terpene. Oh. The... <laughs> Wait, which terpene did you say? Menthol. Yep, that's what I was just gonna say. You read my mind. The most mm. dominant terpene in mint is menthol, which is nuts because yeah. when you smell isolated menthol, you're like, how the hell is this in mint? but it's that bouquet of them all together that really brings it to its true nose. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it smells so delicious, especially in mojito, it just brings out those flavors. Um, I'm also gonna add some fresh cannabis leaves into the bottom of the glass as well uh, to really provide a nice uh, terpene um, enhancement. And so just like the mint, I like to slap the leaves a little bit to wake up those terpenes. I'm gonna put it into the bottom of the glass. Um, then I'm going to add the blackberries. You can just uh, measure out a third of a cup and put them in the bottom of your glass as well. And then I'm also going to add just a few slices of lime uh, just to really get that citrus note in there. So once you have everything in your highball glass, you can start muddling, which of course we're making a mojito. So you want to muddle it pretty good. But I don't like to over muddle because I don't want the leaves to tear, which can sometimes leave like a green um, taste in your drink, which we're trying to avoid. So you just really want to get those mint oils um, and the terpenes from the cannibal leaves in there, as well as to extract the beautiful blackberry juice you guys can see um, after I muddled. So now we have a very dark, lovely, um, like dark purple blackberry mojito going on over here. Um, Love so the after color. You do that, yeah, me too. And I love using blackberries, especially for the color. Um, raspberries are another great one that you can use too. So I'm going to add ice uh, into this glass. Hey, Andrew, you're going to build your egg after this, right? Hell yeah. And it, my feeling looks right. so good. <laughs> um, then we're going to add in a little bit of the simple syrup. So I'm just going to add in a half ounce. Here we go. And you can pour it directly into your glass. I'm also gonna add some rum. So I like to use white rum with this recipe and I'm going to add a half ounce directly into the glass as well. And just pour it right on top of the ice. And then your last step is really just adding sparkling water or club soda. Um, and I'm just gonna add it right in, top it off. And like I said, I'm using bitters in all of my drinks today. So I'm actually gonna add just a little bit of dash of some aromatic bitters in here, which really helps tie in the flavors. And then you can use your bar spoon just to mix everything up. And you can see the colors are so pretty. Uh, and then the last thing is to garnish your drink, of course. So I like to add a fresh, um, sprig of lime or mint <laughs> and then also I'm going to add another fresh cut cannabis leaf and because it is a mojito I'm just going to add a little bit of slice of lime there we go and because it's in a highball glass I'm going to add a straw as well um, for easy enjoyment and that's your blue dream berry mojito so cheers everybody I'm going to give oh, it a taste too. Cheers. <laughs> that looks awesome that's killer. Mm. Very cool.
Well, Delicious. let's fill these eggs up. Right, or unless you're ready, Brandon, I'm going to fill these eggs up and uh, show everybody what I, we whipped up in the meantime. Sure. I just got one quick thing to say. Uh, so I'm doing a little background work here. So y'all aren't uh, watching me and judging me on my juliennes. Uh, I have my apples here and all I'm going to do is hit it with a little bit of red wine vinegar, my infused olive oil and some lemon juice, because as I'm cutting these up, the oil and the acid are going to prevent the oxidation or that browning for the apple. So I just wanted to show you that. Back to you, Andrew. Beautiful, thank you so much. So I've got my beautiful infused uh, egg filling here. The color comes out so nice when you make your own mayo and you have a little bit darker yolks. Again, gives a beautiful, beautiful contrast to the egg. So I will, show you what the eggs look like and fill up my piping tool so that I can fill these and start eating because your man is hungry. And this is what I would enjoy. One of my favorite bar snacks, again, you know, people look at like pickled eggs as such a weird thing, but when you can raise it to a new culinary height, um, people start looking at it a lot differently. And that's what I do as the cannabis sommelier is put different food like you're doing today, Brandon, on a pedestal to really try and show off where we can be and what food can reach. It's all about using your own style and your own creativity. As every young chef and aspiring chef and successful chef knows. So here, yeah, you, gotta, you gotta stick to what you're good at and what you love when you're throwing cannabis into it. Combine your two things together, two passions together. That's the truth. Uh, so if you guys, <laughs> I love that I have all these kitchen gizmos. I love this thing. Uh, for doing cupcakes and stuff like again my wife is the real chef in the house but uh, this tool comes in handy way more than I ever would have expected and it's really easy to fill as well so let's just fill this guy up and then we will just pipe it in there and it'll look oh so pretty and again I should have done what Brandon did and filled this off camera because I'm a citizen scientist not a chef who am I kidding I just get to talk to you guys and show you the mess I make while you're doing that, I can show these, this apple real fast. We'll ping pong here for uh, prep. So um, basically what I'm doing here to, to Julian this apple, if you want to use a mandolin, that is totally fine. Um, it's actually a hell of a lot easier and faster. Just watch your fingernails. Um, <laughs> I'll, wait for the, I'll wait for the camera to, to pop over so I can show just how I'm cutting this here. There we go. Cool. So um, I'm just, you know, cutting the apple so I've got a nice wide flat surface to work with. You're gonna cut, oop, there goes one flying, there goes another one. And then you're going to just lay these on their side. And I just kind of don't even worry about stacking them too much. And then you're just gonna go through and slice like that. All right, back to you, Andrew. Beautiful, and I got it filled and I didn't make a huge mess. And so we'll just uh, wipe this off. I put paper towel in reach, which I'm lucky I did. He's on plots, always important. So I've got it filled and we'll just pipe this right into the egg. And so this is our infused part of the dish. And again, like uh, Chef Brandon mentioned, if your diners don't want an infused dish, it's really easy to have uninfused mayo on the side as well. And then I like to just slowly pipe it in and doesn't that look gorgeous? And we'll give it the little dollop. Boop. I love that color contrast. Purple and nine yellow. Bucks. Nine bucks at the bar, guys. Three, three eggs, nine bucks. You tell me about margins. The prep's kind of hard, <laughs> but they sure taste good and they sure look good. <laughs> so there That's you awesome. go. Those are my eggs. And you know what I'm going to do now is just take these little guys. I'm going to plate them. I should have thought about plating before because I don't have the right colored plates. And I'm sorry if I dig but we'll go with white because white's probably the best. And I didn't go to culinary school, so don't judge me on what I do. And let's take a little bit of this leaf. I was going to do parsley, but I saw everybody else using cannabis leaves uh, in, the, in the dish. And I think that's kind of a cool idea. And that's a cool color contrast as well. We'll see hey, how little, it tastes. A little, a little tip there is if you take your piping uh, little syringe there and you put a tiny little dollop on the plate, and then put your half of your egg Ooh. on top of that dollop. It'll stabilize it. So as the server's taking it out, they're not going to be rocking and rolling everywhere. And yeah, perfect. And that'll just like act as glue. Yes, chef. Thank Good you. Call. 
Oh, look at that. So that, oh, and then a little bit of flex salt on top. And there you go. That's a beautiful little bar snack, nine bucks, whatever you want to charge, but it tastes delicious. It's full of terpenes in so many different ways. It's a cool infusion where you use multiple layers of cannabis cookery to actually get to the point of presenting a, a dish, a snack. Um, again, I'm not a chef, but I will show you and tell you all about the wine pairing that I have with this dish uh, right after we see what's going on with uh, Brandon, I believe. Okay, so I have been working on this apple pepper slaw. Another great way to do this recipe is replace the little mini bell peppers with fennel, okay? Here, y'all can see that I actually practice quite a bit in my skills class on knives. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, the, this, this is the whole purpose of the salad or this slaw is in, for contrast in flavor, but also texture because I'm going to have these creamy, yes, microwave scrambled eggs, uh, which are going to be salty um, and well, salted, should I say. Uh, and then we're going to have that heaviness of that ribeye. Uh, that blue cheese, you're going to get a touch of acid there as well as um, in, in this slaw here. So what I have here uh, are two apples. I used like three quarters of each apple. Uh, I have about eight little mini bell peppers in different colors. They're, they're sweeter, not spicy, just so you all know. Um, and then I added a quarter cup of my CBD infused olive oil which is 50 per tablespoon. So there's 200 milligrams of CBD total in here. Now in a recipe like this, where it's not a completely homogenized, okay? Like you're never going to be able to put an amount onto someone's dish and say, there is five milligrams or 50 milligrams of say THC or CBD. Let's, let's use five of THC. Anytime you're working with an intoxicating cannabinoid, you want to make sure you're putting it into something that would be properly homogenized, like this chimichurri, if we had put THC in there. Okay. But whenever you're dealing with something like this, that is not all even throughout, use non intoxicating cannabinoids like CBD or CBG, um, because at that point, you know, you're, you're not going to, someone's not going to go from having an amazing time to a terrible time if they get an extra 10, 15, 20, or 30 or even 200 milligrams of CBD, but you could give someone an extra two and a half milligrams of THC and they could go from just loving life to you know having a panic attack. So um, what I also added in there was a, uh, the juice of a half of a lemon. Um, and then I'm gonna add some lemon zest in here. I think lemon zest is one of the greatest things that you could have in nearly any recipe. Um, the lemon zest, basically what I'm doing here is throwing in a bunch of terpenes, okay? Um, limonene, which is the most dominant terpene that's found in uh, all citrus um, is the most abundant here. There's also terpinoline, terpinoline, there's pinene, and depending on like lime, for example, has linalool. Um, there's all these like secondary uh, uh, terpenes that aid in that aroma and flavor profile. Um, now. I need to switch out my headset. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I wanna get your feedback of what terpene you think that I should add into here because I've got some of my favorites. So there's really no bad answer. Um, I've got some linalool, which is floral, myrcene, which is earthy floral. I have more linalool, citral, which I told you guys about, but if you want me to try adding in there, I, I'll, I'll give it a go. Beta caryophyllene, which is phenomenal with fennel, uh, also really good with apples. And then I've also got, uh, let's see here, some neurolidol, which is like spicy floral. So uh, I'm gonna swap these guys out and then I'll let you tell me what I should uh, infuse this in next. And um, if uh, someone else wants to take it away for a minute. Yeah, here. check out my plating, I upgraded. I couldn't, I couldn't do it dirty. Uh, to all the oh, chefs. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> oh, hubba hubba. I should have done a smear or a schmoz of something, but I didn't go to culinary school again. But uh, that's how we can use the plant. And they are absolutely delicious. Should I do a pairing right now? Or do you want to make another drink, Jamie? I'll do a pairing. I think that's a good idea if you need me to take yeah, a second, a Brandon. A pairing sounds yeah, um, I'm actually, I'm back, but um, I think I'm pretty good. Uh, one of the, the things that I just wanted to explain here real quick, um, 
was actually, hey, Jackie, real quick. Uh, what, what terpene do you think the most people said that I should add into here? Because this is my way of, you know, this, I'm experimenting here. If someone says a terpene that I normally wouldn't do and it works, great. We'll figure this out together. And if it doesn't, then I'm just going to blame you. Or I'm just going <laughs> to pretend that it tastes good. <laughs> Um, okay, well, we have um, some guesses here from the viewing audience. Um, and one of the guesses is, let me see, uh, uh, is it uh, Neurolidol and B Hero combo? Okay, um, tell you what, since, yes. since, since uh, beta caryophylline, beta caryophylline uh, was, was mentioned, it's actually the one I usually put in this, that's what we'll use here. So uh, beta caryophylline is an interesting terpene. Um, originally research showed that it was uh, an agonist of CB2 receptors, um, but later research has shown that even though it like binds to the receptor, it's kind of like a key that you, you put into a lock and it fits in, but it doesn't turn. So nothing really happens. And more research definitely has to be done on this really interesting cannabis or uh, uh, terpene, but I describe this as spicy licorice, okay? It has like this peppery anise licorice type of super earthy aroma. It goes phenomenal with fennel. It also goes great with apple, which is why originally I do an apple fennel salt with this. And then the pepper kind of adapted to do more of like a, you know, taco type of setting. Um, and uh, so with this one, it's a more mild terpene, at least in the ones that I have. So I know that in this recipe here, there was about eight drops. That'll, that'll do it. Now, one of the things that I should have done, and now that I'm actually uh, thinking about it, I did this a little backwards. Um, what I should have done actually is mixed all my liquids first so that the beta caryophylline was properly homogenized in the liquid. And then that would disperse evenly throughout all of the other uh, ingredients in here. But <clears throat> let's just pretend that happened. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're still on me. Who's up next? <laughs> Let's do a pairing. I'll smash one out. I'd love to. I'm drinking and I'm looking at these eggs like, man, do I want to eat them. Okay. So I mentioned I'm a Canadian. I'm the Canadian presenting for the American Culinary Federation. Uh, Canadian wine is an incredible, incredible thing that I'm so proud to represent. We have some awesome wine growing regions in Canada, in British Columbia. So just north of Washington, Oregon and as well in Ontario, so just north of Michigan, as well as New York. So the wine that I chose specifically today to pair with this spicy pickled deviled egg is Riesling. Uh, I absolutely love Riesling, and Riesling is one of the most important grapes in Canada. Uh, Mid-70s, early 80s, all producers really realize that you can just rip out all the Concord grapes, all the table grapes, and start growing wine grapes, and this would be a much better industry. So you get to the 80s and you have a few of these real big proprietors who start really pushing the agenda of let's change over agricultural land. So Cave Spring, the Pianchetti family specifically, if you can imagine uh, northern New York, like Finger Lakes area, this is literally in between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, right at the tip of New York, but it's in Canada. So Riesling, there's this very important guy in Canada Herman Weiss. And Herman Weiss comes over from the Mosul, from Germany, and he brings all of his cuts. And this is where I love Riesling in contrast to cannabis. You're not allowed to import these products agriculturally without a license. Herman Weiss is like, yeah, doesn't matter. Fills suitcases full of vine cuttings, plants them in Canada. They're incredibly hardy. So then everybody in the Niagara region starts using the Weiss cut of Riesling to start growing the Riesling because cold winters kill plants, right? It's, it's a hard thing. Um, so these grapes are from plots all over the Niagara region, right between Lake Ontario, and Lake Erie. Um, really nice high acidity. 2017 was a quintessential Canadian Niagara summer. We're talking hot, hot, hot. I'm, you know, I was about to talk in Celsius, but everybody's American. So like 100 degree days, and then you have those nice cold nights. And that's where you get that peaking acidity and those awesome characteristics is that cold night in those hot days. And this Riesling is a perfect example of that. Cave Spring likes to say that they're, the Riesling built their house. And why is that? It's because everybody just drew to this juice. A lot of people have this bad name for Riesling for some reason because they haven't drank 
kick ass Riesling. It should be high acidity. It should have some sweetness. It should be complex. And my favorite ones do present that petrol character. And that's exactly what this 2017 Cave Spring Riesling is. Uh, all of those things, right? High acid, a little bit of sugar, just barely off dry, 12 grams of residual sugar, all pairs super well with something pickled. And what better than a pickled cannabis infused egg? It's awesome. But before I eat one, pairing with cannabis is even easier. And if you're just going to smell it, we've all done wine pairings, sniff your glass, look like you know what you're doing. That's the most important part of pairing or uh, tasting wine is just pretending like you know what you're doing. Swirl, sniff, get to know your wine. This one's lemon, lime, petrol. You know, it's, it's got a little bit of that funk. I would call it the skunk, just that, that indicativeness of like a nice small batch Riesling. And then you're going to take your cannabis and smell it the same way. Deep, swirl it, pretend like you know what you're doing, but get to know it. Really love it, understand it, think about it in the back of your head. This is uh, lemon cookies that I grew from a cut that I cultivated. And this one's really forward in lemon, lime, like fake vanilla, a little bit of cake. And so it tends to go really well with wines that are peaking in limonene and terpinaline, like a Riesling, high lemon, high lime. So together you could take them, sniff, sniff, sniff. And then you start confusing your olfactory reflex, the reflex in the back of your nose that really dissects these smells. We can only taste five things, sour, sweet, salty, bitter, and umami. We can smell millions of combinations of things. Any emotion can be evoked. So when you start confusing and really diving in with your senses, you start to create this new pairing. And you can do that, confuse your palate, have a sip of wine, and then eat a deviled egg. And you never even had to smoke cannabis. And you had a cannabis pairing. Back to you, chef. Awesome. Very good. So before, uh, Jamie, you make the, the last cocktail here, uh, just to give you all an update of where I'm at. I just got the air fryer ripping at 375, which might not seem like that's ripping, but it is for the world of, uh, of air fryers. They go up to 400, but I wouldn't recommend it. At least this one does. So um, my temp is at 122. So I pulled it at 109. It rested all the way up to 121. And those of you who might not have caught it, that's a three inch, maybe a little bit more ribeye. Um, some might even call that a rib roast. I call that a meal um, to myself. <laughs> so I'm going to pull this at, I'm going to pull it at a hundred because I'm, it's already rested. Um, I'm going to basically pull this at no more than like 128 or so. Um, and since it already has rested again, I can cut into this hot and, and it hopefully won't be bleeding all over. We are going to let it rest a little bit though. But the whole point here is that fat is just like melty and delicious. Uh, but now I'm getting that hard sear on there and it's fantastic. Okay. So while, uh, that is working, uh, I'm going to let Jamie, take it away with the cocktail that's actually going to uh, pair well with this heavy, uh, also herbaceous and semi-sweet taco. It's a, there's a lot of um, contrast and flavors and textures that are going to be <laughs> happening. And then um, when she's done there, I'm going to bring it back. We're going to do our microwaved stoner scramble, I guess we can call it. <laughs> uh, um, and then uh, while I'm doing that, my steak will be resting a little bit. I'll build this taco. We'll wrap this up. Um, I'll take some Q&A as uh, we're, we're uh, plating the taco dish here. Thanks. All Margaret. right. Thank you, Chef. Yeah. So for my final drink, I'm going to make a drink called the Citrus Spice and Everything Nice Negroni. So this is going to be big and bold to pair with your entree. And remember, what we're going to infuse this drink with is the Citrus Spice Bitters uh, that we made at the beginning of the show. Of course, this is going through the infusion process, which takes about 15 days. Uh, plus a few extra to finish. Uh, so we're just going to use the one that I already made to infuse this drink. And I think something that's really important when you're making cannabis cocktails or cannabis drinks at home um, is to actually dose the drinks um, quite low. So you can have more than one. And so with THC, I usually recommend staying between one to five milligrams. Um, so you can have more than one and still enjoy it. And so with this drink, we're making a Negroni, of course. So I recommend sticking to the one to one to one principle. So we're gonna do um, one ounce of your Campari. And I'm it's gonna- It's my favorite right cocktail. In. Oh yeah, mm. I love Negroni. I love it. One of my favorites. 
And we're gonna pour it right into your mixing glass with ice. You never wanna shake a Negroni. Uh, so you're gonna pour one ounce of the Campari. We're gonna pour one ounce of vermouth. Is it the Lillette vermouth that you're using? Um, this is Dolan, actually. Oh, Dolan's is great. Yeah, delicious. Yeah, a beautiful, beautiful vermouth. Um, it really goes well with this cocktail. Um, and then I'm going to be using a gin from St. George. If you guys aren't familiar with this brand, they have a wonderful line of gin. Um, so this is their dry gin that I'm going to use. And just do one ounce. And then pour it in there. And then I'm going to get my bar spoon once again and just stir it up into your mixing glass. And what you want to do when you're stirring is to really keep your bar spoon as steady as possible and not integrate air into the cocktail, um, which really helps with the mouth feel. And so once you give it a good stir and it gets nice and cold, um, I'm just going to put my Hawthorne strainer on top of the mixing glass. And then I have an old fashioned glass here with a big ice cube inside. I just like to put one ice cube with my Negronis. And so you can go ahead and pour it in. And then the last step is to infuse it. So what I like to do with this cocktail is just to dot the drink uh, with your bitters, which is really gonna enhance the aromatics. It's gonna bring all the flavors together. Um, so I'm just gonna dot the top of the drink which really provides that boost of botanicals and spices that are in there. Um, we're gonna garnish this drink as well. So I have um, a fresh orange. I'm just gonna peel off a piece. And then what I'm gonna do is use my cocktail pick and I'm gonna thread it through. And then the last step is of course, I'm using another cannabis leaf <laughs> and I'm just gonna thread it through the drink and you can set uh, your garnish right on top. Let's see. And there you go, your citrus spice, everything nice Negroni. Beautiful. For 420. <laughs> cheers, Four Jamie. Cheers. That's an awesome drink. Yeah, it's delicious. Awesome. Okay, mm. so I realize that we are approaching that 90 minute mark, but guess what folks, we're gonna be going a little bit longer here because it's 420 and Okay, here's the thing. Usually everything in the cannabis industry starts like late. Well, we started on time, so we're going to go late <laughs> instead. That might sound like a stereotypical thing, but I'm telling you, I've been to more events that have been like 30 minutes in. Where, what's going on here? Anyway, um, so, hey, Jackie, it'd be great if we could take uh, a couple questions uh, while my ribeye is getting the temp here and, uh, you know, hear, hear a little bit more from 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 our viewers and, and everyone right now, say where you're, where you're tuning in from again, just so everyone can see it. Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas currently. So if you are here, send me a DM at Chef Brandon out on Instagram, say hello. I'd love to see uh, and meet up with some of the folks in uh, good old Austin, but let's get some questions going. Okay, well, fabulous. One of the questions that had come in was about, um, does the ABV of the alcohol that you're using matter when you're infusing um, beverages with cannabis? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let one bitter? of our one of our beverage experts take that. Yeah. So with the ABV, when you're doing bitters specifically, um, it does matter a lot because the higher proof that you have, the more extraction you're going to get. So often with my bitters, um, I try to choose alcohols that have a higher ABV. And in the book, you're also going to find um, a celery bitters that uses Everclear to do the extraction. Uh, but for my cocktails. Um, it, you know, you can definitely use different types of ABVs, but, um, for higher proof drinks, I actually recommend doing a lower dose of THC to kind of keep it balanced because you really want to have that nice drinking experience where you're not overdoing it. And like I said, beginning of the show, start low, go slow. And this is why I just mark microdose of the Negroni with just some bitters rather than using, um, something else to make a more potent infusion. So that's just what I recommend. Andrew, it sounds like you have some good tips as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like you said, infusion, if, you're, if you are doing infusion and you're trying to draw the cannabinoids out of cannabis, you need high alcohol. That's your solvent. Uh, that's what's going to take those cannabinoids uh, out of the cannabis and put it into your beverage and suspend it there. 
Now, if you are cocktailing with cannabis, I think it's super important to look at low ABV cocktails. Um, you know, a Negroni is a good example, even though it's three equal parts hard alcohol, there's no sugar, there's no filler. And two of the alcohols are liqueurs. Um, when I was the Luxardo Canadian ambassador, that was a big push on what we could do to kind of change drinking habits. And one of the things that we saw in drinking habits was people were really looking for a cocktail sub 20% alcohol. And as we talk about cannabis cocktailing, moving into a world where we can make a full blown co cocktail infused with cannabis without alcohol is really the next step where we need to go. So that's kind of my two cents on that question. Right. Yeah. So in the, in the world of extraction, um, the ethanol that's utilized in these, these processing facilities is not 190 to 200 proof. And it's only washed over the plant material for a brief amount of time. And then it goes into uh, solvent recovery, filtering, distillation, et cetera. Um, but, you know, so the higher the alcohol ABV, the faster you could say that it will actually dissolve those cannabinoids. Um, versus, you know, an, an 80 proof, which is why like the tincture that Jamie made, uh, Jamie, how long did that, that set with the, in the bullet, bullet rye? Oh, so or, this is going to sit for 15 days with the alcohol. Yeah. So, yep. and then yeah. with that, you could even give that a little stir here and there, uh, to, to agitate that and, and whatnot, yep. but you know, I've done you alcohol. You keep shaking it every yep. day. <laughs> Every day, exactly. So um, keep that in mind. The lower the ABV, the longer it's going to take to fully extract all of those cannabinoids. Yeah, more waters in it. Less ABV, more water. All right, so I'm 125 and a half degrees. We're going to pull this at 127. So this is going to be like a um, probably closer to the rarer. Uh, I think I'm going to cut from the, what's it called? The spinalis, which is that fat cap of the ribeye, which is so thick. And I, I think that's the greatest cut of meat of any animal. Um, so we'll cut from there because it's going to be so juicy and tender. But anyway, Jackie, uh, next question until we hit that mark. Sure. One of the other questions that came in, I uh, was wondering if terpenes are fat soluble or water soluble. Uh, it's a, it's actually a mix. It depends on the terpene. Um, for, for the majority of the ones out there in their dominant amounts that you're going to find in cannabis that just, just play the role that they are uh, a fat soluble thing as well. Um, so, you know, what, what that means are, so cannabinoids, <clears throat> cannabinoids as well as terpenes are, you know, um, uh, hydro, uh, or lipophilic, okay. which means they're, they're fat loving or hydrophobic or lipophilic. Um, so the reason that we're utilizing fats like olive oil, uh, like coconut oil, butter, ghee, different things like that is because you, they have the, the ability to dissolve these cannabinoids, these other compounds out of the plant itself. So um, for the most part, just go down the lane that they are going to be fat soluble. Uh, I would, you know, if you're, if you're a geek like me and you like to research all these things, then I would recommend, uh, you know, Googling water soluble uh, terpenes, but what you might find is it's not like the normal terpene or terpenoid oxygenated form. It could be like another type of form that's broken down as it's exposed to heat, light, humidity, UV exposure, things like that. So. Fabulous. Yeah. All right. Um, one of the other questions that came in, I'm not sure if anyone would like to take this or not. There's a little bit of a debate whether this is legal or not. Okay. <laughs> ooh, ooh, me. I should, oh. Actually, we should... We should all respond to this. Um, so this, what you are seeing is 100% legal uh, because you are, you are viewing uh, people who are working with cannabis in areas of the, the North America at this point uh, that have different laws. Now I'm in Texas, uh, I'm in Austin, Texas where marijuana is decriminalized up to a certain amount but I'm working strictly with, with hemp, hemp right now. I have literally a, a bucket filled with all of these amazing hemp things and infusions that I'm working on and all this hemp flower. I mean, everything in here is completely federally legal because there is no more than 0.3% Delta 9 THC total. So uh, y'all are watching me streaming from Texas, 100% legal. What about you, Andrew? I'm in Canada where every single person has the right to grow four plants 
every single person, we're all allowed to walk around with 30 ounces of cannabis and we all have freedom of speech and educational right to talk about what we believe in. And I'm just trying to make sure that you execute your culinary experience uh, in a safe manner, whatever you choose to do in adult use category, wherever you are in the world. And uh, what's up to Jamaica? I saw that right there. I can't wait to get back. Man, we were gonna do some crazy culinary things in Jamaica. You just wait, chef, hit me up at the Cannabis Psalm. We'll make sure that uh, you're part of that because it's gonna be fantastic. Jamie, what about you? Yeah, so I'm in California. Of course, league, or cannabis is definitely legal here. Um, and when you're mixing cannabis and alcohol, you can certainly do this in the comfort of your own home. Uh, so this is what I wanna teach you in my new book, Cannabis Drinks, is how to do this safely and responsibly. Um, of course, in the book too, there's recipes for mocktails, smoothies, juices, uh, coffee drinks, you name it. Um, so it's really just about exploring the plants. And it's always a good idea, though, to look up the regulations in the state you live in. Uh, so as you can see, we're all in different places. And we all have different regulations on where we're at. Uh, but that was a great question. Uh, so yeah, thank you for asking. Awesome. Okay, folks. So my ribeye, I don't know if y'all can switch to my other camera here so you can see this just amazing hunk of meat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and the steak too, okay? So you can see that, let's uh, pull this out a little bit so it doesn't drip everywhere. The fat, okay, is Ooh. just like, it's amazing, okay? It, it just melts, you want to eat it. We got a nice sear on there as well. So um, while uh, you can swap back to the other camera, while that is going to rest for a little bit, and we'll see, there's, there's going to be different, like I've been experimenting with, um, with cooking thicker, thinner and thicker ribeyes and different other types of steaks in this air fryer. I could probably just write a cookbook on that already, but I'm still doing <laughs> the experiments because I think it's such a cool way to cook. I mean, I love my grill. I love butter basting and a cast iron, but this is like just an awesome tool. Um, so, and because of what it does to fat, that's why I'm fascinated by, um, and legit, you saw the size of that. That's two and a half pounds. I eat about that much meat a day. Um, so anyway, so we're going to let this sit for a little bit and now we're going to get to our microwaved scramble. Okay. So, um, this is kind of, okay. I, I learned, learned this in Subway when I worked there. Don't worry. It's there you good. go. Well, there's, there's ways you can do a microwave scrambled egg that's spongy and freaking disgusting. Okay, but listen, I live in an RV, okay, it's 37 feet. I'm like in one part and then I'm in another just a couple feet away. So uh, my wife and I like, it, sometimes it's a pain in the butt to like pull up the stove and cook in a pan and it's small. So you see more of the mess and whatnot. And I wanted to master microwave scramble. So this is what we're gonna do. Uh, I have about two tablespoons of butter and I'm gonna microwave this to start off for about it depends on the strength of your microwave. You're going to have to experiment with this, but um, this is like an, a regular convection uh, microwave, even though I do live in a van down by the river. While this is microwaving, Jackie, you got another question for me? Of course, of course. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is um, that many of the recipes that the chef who is viewing has seen are all can of butter. And so they're wondering um, what are some of the differences if you're um, infusing uh, ways that you can infuse foods? Yeah, so any type of fat you can basically infuse. Um, this butter is regular butter. If I were to infuse a butter, I actually personally would not use butter. I would use ghee uh, because a lot of times it ends up breaking um, and you're separating the, you know, yep. the, the protein from the fat. And you're, you know, think about your, if you were to separate that completely, you're left to clarify. Now you can uh, add some like soy lecithin uh, or sunflower lecithin, and you can kind of bring that back together and it will stabilize. But I've found that even at that point, you don't get that normal like butter uh, type of, of um, slice to it. Okay. Um, so I am more personally a fan of working with uh, infused fats, like specifically pure fats, like a ghee or, um, uh, you know, avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, beef tallow, lard, duck. I mean, I, if you name it, if, if it used to, 
if I had a mother, I've infused it. Okay. I've, I've used so many different types of fats and it's delicious. So, uh, as you can see here, I've got my butter and it's nice and melted. And then what I'm doing is just spinning this around so that that butter is getting all up along the sides there. And now I have five eggs that I have whipped up here and I'm just going to hit it once more time as I pour this in. Um, these are, uh, eggs from vital farms. They're like medium, medium to large. I would say closer to medium. That's been sitting for a minute. So I got a little rim there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stir this up a bit because I want that egg to kind of actually cool down the butter. And you're going to start to see chunks of that butter fat start to cool down and thicken up. And then what happens is you end up with this butter that is kind of like all dispersed around uh, into the egg there. And if you use, uh, if your eggs are really cold, like these have been sitting out for a little bit, then you, that'll cool that butter down immediately. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put this for another minute in the microwave there. Um, so going back to some of the infusions, you know, uh, you can also infuse things like honey and, and glycerin. A lot of people are using glycerin to, you know, to put into as a water soluble uh, compound. Same thing with honey. Um, there are ways that you can utilize flour to do those infusions for, for, from a sake, from a kitchen and also understanding your dosing. And uh, for, the sac for the fact that you, like, if you're infusing honey, you generally want that honey flavoring. You don't want it to be, you know, overwhelmed by a, a really earthy type of infusion in there. Um, what I would recommend is using distillate for those things. Um, and even though the cannabis is supposed to be water, I'm sorry, isn't supposed to be water soluble and honey and glycerin are, it has to do with chemistry, which I don't even completely understand, but I had to explain to me and polarity of this and that, and it's able to still pull these compounds in. But really I would say, get yourself some distillate and uh, use that to infuse um, those other things. Okay, so we're gonna keep this moving here. So you can see here with the egg, I'm starting to get like almost like little like curds, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm, as I'm stirring, I'm pressing down and I am trying to break up any bit of those curds. Now I do not have salt in here. This is just unsalted butter and the egg. And what uh, the reason why is because as um, Harold McGee has explained in, on food and cooking, uh, when you add salt to your eggs earlier on, what ends up happening is the, the salt breaks down the protein and it doesn't coagulate as, as good. So, you know, I don't know if, if I said that properly, but all right. So now what we're going to do is, oops, 20 seconds. So we started with a minute, stirred it up, pressed down any type of little uh, egg curdles there, I guess we'll call it. And then we're going to do 20 seconds and then 10 to 15 seconds at a time after that. Uh, for this taco, I want a, an egg that is creamy, but it's not super um, loose. Now, normally if I'm just eating these by myself, I like almost like a custard type of scramble egg. Okay, so you can see here, we got a good amount of heat that is coming out with that steam. And all I'm doing is pressing down as I am breaking up these little egg curds. And now I'm gonna put this in for, based on the way that looks, let's do 10 seconds. And what you have to consider with these eggs is all of that uh, ambient uh, heat that's gonna be remaining. Uh, so when you pull these out, you might think that they're gonna look like they're not done, um, but they will continue to cook. I actually, at this point, personally will pull these and not put them back in because there's so much heat left in here. And I love getting this like custardy type of scramble. Um, and the other thing is as I'm pulling this out and I'm stirring it each time, I am also essentially kind of emulsifying that butter into the egg. Now you look at that, that looks super loose. If I let this sit for about two minutes, that will firm up into this beautiful custardy egg. Now, some of you might be losing your cool right now because I just told you that I like a nice custardy egg. Um, if you've never done eggs this way, I would highly recommend it. It's a completely different world. Instead of getting those like 
little sponges of scrambled eggs that the only reason that they're palatable is because they're smothered with cheese or ketchup. Um, so I would say uh, give this a shot. Now you can see this is firmed up quite a bit. This right here, this is like my personal sweet spot right there. Like I said, if I last time, if I let that sit uh, for about two minutes, that's about where it would have ended up. Now for this taco, I want this to be a little bit firmer, but I can feel in this bowl here, I have enough heat right now that they're gonna firm up. I don't need to put this in again. So one minute and then 20 seconds and then 10 seconds at a time. And you gotta pull it earlier than what you think. Now at this point, I'm gonna show you one of the simplest ways to infuse. I call this the retail ready infusion, which is where you buy a store bought type of uh, product. This is actually one that uh, since everyone's promoting their books, I'll promote something I'm a little bit of a part of. Uh, I partnered up with Santa Cruz Medicinals on this. This is a 11,000 milligram and 1,000 milligrams of CBD and CBG. So in this entire container, there are 11,000 milligrams of cannabinoids, super potent. And per quarter teaspoon, we're going to get about 112 of CBD and then uh, about 13 milligrams of CBG. Now, what's great, this is organic extra virgin olive oil and there's a touch of natural sweetness to it. So with this in the egg here, I'm just gonna mix this around. Now this- Hey Chef, this can I interrupt you for a sec? Cause I'm just running really late and, and I gotta go. And I just wanna say goodbye to everybody while you mix up your oh, scramble. Sure thing. Uh, I just wanna thank everybody so much for joining us on 420. Uh, my name is The Cannabis Sommelier. You can find me anywhere at The Cannabis Sommelier. My name is Andrew Friedman. My new book is Terpenes for Wellbeing. You can learn all of the things we talked about in this book and so much more. And I really appreciate you just being uh, curious about cannabis. And thank you so much for spending your time on 420 hanging out with me and the other chefs. Uh, cheers to all of you. Thank you so much. Try some Canadian wine. Cool. Smoke some good cannabis. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, folks, so I've got this ribeye out. We're going to wrap this up here in a minute. Now I have uh, some butcher swine on there. Just going to pop that off. And this just smells unreal because of that low and slow method in the air fryer. Uh, the fat, as you can see, it just kind of like melts off. Look, look at that. It's just, oh, it's decadent. Um, where's my other twine there? There we go. Woo. Now, usually let these go all the way to the end. I, I wouldn't rest in between. So what I'm gonna do here is pop off, I believe this is called the spinalis. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of a little bit there. And it's that cap of the ribeye. And we're just going to slice this up for our taco. Now this, oh my gosh, beautiful. This is a, little bit, closer to, a little bit closer to medium just because it's on the exterior of the, the steak, but this is also one of the just mouth-watering tender cuts of the, the ribeye. I'm gonna actually hit y'all with a little light above so you can see this a little bit better. There you go. Um, with that light in the front cam, my bald dome there is uh, just ricocheting some beams back at you, okay? So beautiful for that fat cap, okay? You're gonna want to eat this. And then I'm just gonna cut into the center here, which you can see is nicely and evenly cooked throughout. That is a beautiful medium rare. Mm. Look at that. So I'm going to build this taco uh, as Jamie is giving her farewells. And then we'll let, uh, I'll show you the taco. We'll let J or Jackie wrap up and uh, let y'all get going with your 420. Great, well, thank you, Chef. And again, my name is Jamie Evans. I'm the founder of The Herb Psalm. So please follow me at The Herb Psalm on social media. Um, check out my book, Cannabis Drinks, because the crafting CBD and THC beverages at home if you're interested in learning more. There's a lot of great infusions in here. There's expert spotlights, recipes, uh, you name it. Um, so please check this out. You can visit my website. Uh, theherbsom.com as well. I have a lot of great recipes on there um, as well as cooking advice. And my first book, The Ultimate Guide to CBD actually came out last year. Uh, so I hope to see you out here in California. Thank you so much for having me today and cheers. Happy 420, everybody.
All right. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. So I've got a little bit of blue cheese that I'm going to put down first because your tongue is going to hit that and you want to have that nice creamy acid. Plus, as you put some of this microwave scramble right on there, that's going to help meld it a bit and it's just going to be ooey gooey and delicious. And you can see that the scramble is super creamy. Now I have some hemp flour that I've been guess you could say marinating in some kosher salt here just for the aroma profile. I didn't salt these eggs yet, but I'm just going to put a little bit on there. This is an experiment that I'm working on. I'm going to see if like you can even taste anything uh, herbal or terpene driven or not. Um, you know, this is about a weekend. We're going to let it go for about two. And now on the first one here, let me grab my little, uh, little tongs. This is so such a delicate cut that that is going to, and this fat, uh, some of you might not want it, but I'm telling you, it's absolutely fantastic. And then I'm just gonna slice up here, a couple pieces for the other side of the actual eye itself to put in. Now, if you wanna try this air fryer ribeye method and you wanna cook it to a different doneness, then by all means, I'm just happy people are eating meat. There's that. And then we're gonna get this apple, pepper slaw that has a CBD infusion as well as um, our terpene that we put in here, which was beta caryophylline. Throw that on there. And that contrast and sweetness and texture is going to be awesome for this taco. And then we're going to put a little bit extra blue cheese right on top. Just a tad. If you are a lover of blue cheese like me, put as much as you like. Uh, this is a pretty medium, I would say, blue cheese that I got here. It's made with raw cheese. And then because I don't have any type of um, uh, onion or pepper that's cooked, or even onion that's raw, we're going to put a little bit of the chive that I minced up. And then our CBD infused chimichurri. Just drizzle that. This is super earthy, a little bit of uh, bitterness and acid. It's just really going to bounce out some of these heavier flavors from the taco. So there you have it, folks. This is a hemp derived cannabinoid and terpene air fried ribeye wow. microwave scramble breakfast taco so um that looks hmm. delish oh my god i am i'm excited to get here i'll give you all a little a little closer up if you need it <laughs> that looks amazing oh my gosh well thank thank you so much i mean absolutely a huge, a huge virtual round of applause as we thank uh brandon and jamie and andrew for such an amazing and insightful presentation we certainly uh, appreciate you taking the time to share your culinary cannabis insights with the ACF community of culinary professionals today. And we hope that you'll join us on our next webinar, which will be on Thursday, uh, April 22nd. We have an exciting fruit and vegetable carving skills demonstration by Chef Stephen Beatty. Uh, now, Chef Brandon, I know that I'm excited to have the opportunity to hang out with you in Orlando at ACF National Convention, which will be August 2nd through 5th. Uh, Chef, um, uh, why are you most excited to uh, be with the ACF community in person in Orlando this summer? Well, I'm super excited to help normalize cannabis through food. And I am so thrilled that the ACF is, is, is taking this, this leap uh, because I think an organization like this will really have a, an ama amazing impact on helping normalize this plant. So I'm excited to see y'all in Orlando. I'm excited to launch this cooking with cannabis course with y'all and, uh, you know, just end prohibition one bite at a time. I love it. I love it. I'm still going to go. My favorite quote of the night was, was if I, if it had a mother, um, I probably infused it. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to have that as my, my funny takeaway of the evening, but again, happy 420 to everyone. And again, thank you so much to our speakers today, um, for sharing their knowledge and expertise. We look forward to more. So if you um, have enjoyed the presentation, we will be sending the recording and a survey to you tomorrow. So be on the lookout in your email. Thank you again for joining us. 
On behalf of the ACF National Office, we'd also like to share a message from our national president. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the beautiful World Center Marriott here in Orlando, Florida, the site of the 2021 National Convention, August 2nd through 5th. My name is Tom Macrina. I'm ACF president, and I couldn't begin to tell you how excited I am about this convention. It is great that we're all gonna be here. For many of us, this is the first time we are meeting face to face in nearly two years. Be ready for the biggest ACF family reunion you've ever attended. This will be so much fun. I can't wait to see everybody. This year's theme is Ignite Your Passion. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the ACF 2021 National Convention. We have some phenomenal keynote speakers lined up. Cutting edge education sessions, pop-up tastings, networking, and oh yeah, we're doing it all face to face with each other. Plus, competition is back. For the first time since 2019, ACF competitions will be in full swing with a record setting number of competitors lined up for their shot at the gold. I also want to fill you in on our collaboration with Orlando World Center Marriott. We are so pleased with the Marriott's dedication to providing the safest and most courteous environment possible for ACF members. The Marriott planning and preparation to help us follow CDC guidelines during our national convention is second to none. I can't wait for this convention to come. I'm very excited to see everyone face to face. There's competitions, there's education, there's everything. But the most important part is sitting at the bar and having a nice cocktail and relaxing. Registration for the ACF 2021 National Convention is open. So head to the events page at acfchefs.org to learn more or click on the link in this video's description. To everyone in the ACF family, please stay safe, stay healthy, and I can't wait to see you at this year's 2021 ACF National Convention in Marriott World Center, Orlando, Florida.